All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of What's in the Night Sky for August 2020 with me, Alan Wallace, and what a month of astronomy and astrophotography we just had. Comet Neowise, unexpectedly bright, has captivated the entire northern hemisphere and it became the most photographed comet of all time. And it couldn't have come at a better time either. But this month, we will say farewell to Comet Neowise. We do have one of the best meteor showers of the year with the Perseids. Venus reaches greatest westerly elongation. We are entering the latter half of Milky Way core season. And it's also a good time to watch Pleiades rising from the horizon. But before we deep dive into all of that, a quick message from the sponsors of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. There are thousands of inspiring classes covering a huge range of creative topics such as graphic design, photography, videography, freelancing and more. I'm sure many of you watching this video will appreciate Ian Norman's class on nightscapes, an incredible introduction to all things landscape astrophotography. Or how about James Manning's Astronomy for Starscapes which will help you make sense of the night sky and plan your astro photographs with ease. I've been using Skillshare for just over a year now and I've used it for all sorts sorts of stuff. There are lots of good classes on freelancing and running a business and also Adobe Premiere classes that help me edit these videos. Premium members get access to all of those courses and you can try as many as you like and if you want to join along just follow the link in the video description and you get two months completely free of Skillshare Premium. Alright guys let's start with Comet Neowise. So for the past few weeks now it's really faded and dimmed significantly. The dust tail has thinned out and it's probably already gone completely by the time this video is out. But we still have the green coma, the atmosphere around the nucleus of the comet. And we also have the blue iron tail persisting as well. So sadly, Comet Neowise is no longer a naked eye visible object. It's exclusive to binoculars, telescopes, and your cameras and even though now in your wide angle shots it's not going to look great with the sort of wide angle landscape shots it's still worth using the telephoto lenses especially if you have a star tracker but some good news for those of you in the southern hemisphere because i know you've been looking on in jealousy as the northern hemisphere have been photographing comet neowise but comet neowise is now visible from the southern hemisphere sadly it's not as bright but at least the entire world will be able to bid farewell to Comet Neowise together. But before we look at the Southern Hemisphere, let's take a general look at the Northern Hemisphere night sky. So starting with the Northern Hemisphere, you'll see now that Comet Neowise has really drifted westward and it's an evening object now. So it goes from the west and comes down to the northwestern horizon and sets about 1.30 a.m. but as the month goes by it drifts even further west um, towards the end of the month it starts in the evening skies in the west southwest and then sets below the western horizon before midnight so as the month goes by it's drifting westward it is fading it is dimming but still worth getting the telephoto lenses out and photographing the green coma and the blue iron tail. Now if we swing around to the north and I just put the constellations on, you'll see that as darkness falls and throughout the course of the night, Ursa Major, the big bear, is in its upright position. And so Ursa Major now is low on the northern horizon. It's very photogenic in this position. And because it's low on the horizon, it's good for some landscape astrophotography. <clears throat> and especially now with the star glow filter, it looks amazing. So a good time of year to photograph Ursa Major. Swing into the south, you'll see that as darkness falls, the Milky Way core is in the south southwest and as the night goes on it sets in the southwest at 1 30 a.m local time so we're in the latter half now of milky way core season so make the most of it whilst you can 
Saturn, but you'll also notice that Jupiter and Saturn are still eastward of the Milky Way core. They are both retrograding in Sagittarius. Jupiter, the brighter of the two, uh, dims a little bit from minus 2.7 to minus 2.6, and Saturn shines at a modest 0.1 and dims to 0.3 by the end of the month. And if we swing over to the east, you'll see Mars rising about 11 p.m. So very late evening, you've got Mars rising, and it's getting brighter as the month goes by. So it goes from minus 1.1 to minus 1.8. Uh, really nice to photograph. You really get a nice deep orange red color, uh, even with your, your naked eye. And another thing worth noting now is Pleiades. So Pleiades is rising in the northeast. You can see about 11 p.m. And normally with a deep sky object like this, you'd want to wait until it was high in the night sky to photograph. But it's nice to take advantage of it whilst it's low on the horizon so that you can feature it with some sort of foreground interest. Maybe a building or a monument or a tree or a person, whatever. Uh, it's just nice to take advantage when it's low on the horizon. And then lastly, looking straight up to the zenith, the point of sky above you, you can see that we've got the Cygnus region, the Cygnus constellation. Uh, so if you wanted to pull the star trackers out, it's a great region uh, to photograph. You've got the North American nebula, the Pelican nebula, but lots of hydrogen alpha emission nebulae around the Sada region. And it's just a really beautiful area of the night sky. Uh, very easy to locate from the summer triangle. So we've got Vega from the constellation Lyra, Alta from the constellation Aquila, and Deneb from the constellation Cygnus. These three stars make the summer triangle, and when they're directly overhead, you know you're in peak summer. And again, another asterism that looks really great through the star glow filter. As for conjunctions and close approaches this month, so on the evening of the 1st of August, you'll see that the moon is right next to Jupiter. And if you shoot with a 400 mil or a 600 mil, you might be able to get a shot of the moon, Jupiter, and Jupiter's Galilean moons, or at least three of the four. So we've got Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Um, so if you get it in twilight, you should be able to do it in a single exposure. If not, it will have to be uh, two exposures, with one of the exposures being for the Galilean moons of Jupiter. Uh, but you might be able to get them together during twilight, so keep that in mind. And then the next day on the 2nd, the moon is a little bit closer to Jupiter, making a nice triplet there. And if we skip forward a few days on the 9th, the moon will be right next to Mars, yeah, pretty close still on the 10th. Uh, but perhaps more interestingly is on the 13th, uh, the moon will be nice and close to Aldebaran from Taurus, really bright star, uh, as well as Pleiades, the open star cluster. And this is around the time of the Perseids peak as well, so quite an interesting opportunity there. Maybe a shot of these three beautiful objects with some Perseid meteors as well. As you can see Venus there, but the Moon and Venus don't come together until the 15th. They're pretty close, and the 16th. Um, so a nice little opportunity in the morning skies on the 15th and the 16th. And then towards the end of the month, on the 28th, the moon is back with Jupiter. Uh, and on the 29th, again, close to Saturn. So a little bit of a repeat of the first couple of days of the month. Now in the Southern Hemisphere, you can finally see Comet Neowise. And it starts in the evening in the Northwest and sets pretty quickly in the evening skies. And although it's not a naked eye object, sadly, you can still see it with binoculars and your cameras, especially your telephoto lenses. And as the month goes by, it becomes more and more westward and it spans a little bit longer in the skies for you. So still some good opportunities for you and at least you guys get to see it before 
it heads off back to outer space for another six or seven thousand years. Swinging to the south, you can see that the small and large Magellanic clouds are pretty low on the horizon for most of the evening. And you've got the Carina Nebula, the Carina region there in the southwest as well. And as for the Milky Way core, it's pretty much overhead in the evening sky. So if you have a Star Tracker, get on the Milky Way core. It just looks incredible when it's on the zenith. It's not very good for landscape astrophotography, but do some tracking. It looks superb. But as the night goes on, the Milky Way core does come down to the southwest, and there's a good opportunity there to do a nice panorama. And if you go really wide with a panorama, you can get the large and small Magellanic clouds, the Milky Way, and Andromeda, the spiral galaxy as well. As for the planets, as you can see, Jupiter and Saturn uh, not too far away from the galactic core. Jupiter shining minus 2.7 to minus 2.6. Saturn shining 0.1 to 0.3 by the end of the month. And you'll later see Mars rising in the east at some point. There it is there. And Mars getting brighter this month from minus 1.1 to minus 1.8. That's rising about local 11 p.m. And then in the morning skies, oh, look at that, you guys get Orion. Oh, I'm so jealous. You guys can already photograph Orion in the pre-dawn hours down in the southern hemisphere. If I just turn on the constellations, you can see there, you guys are so, so lucky. And Pleiades as well. So as you can see, Pleiades rising at about 1 a.m. with Orion. Oh. As you can see there, Venus rising in into the northeast skies about quarter to five in the morning so the pre-dawn hours the really bright venus minus 4.4 and on august the 13th venus reaches its greatest western elongation 45.8 degrees away from the sun so that's the highest it will reach in the sky before the sun comes up and then as the month goes by it just gets lower and lower and lower and closer to the sun. As for conjunctions and close approaches, same date as the northern hemisphere, so on the first you've got the moon right next to Jupiter and again if you use a telephoto lens you should be able to get three of the Galilean moons as well in the same image but you will have to shoot during twilight to do that in a single exposure where you get the moon, Jupiter and three of Jupiter's moons as well. On the second bit closer to Saturn and it's not until the 9th or the 8th apologies it's not until the 8th where it will be right next to Mars on the 9th still close to Mars but not quite as close as the 8th and then perhaps the best opportunity or at least one of the most photogenic opportunities is on the 15th the crescent moon and venus in the morning skies if you want to wake up nice and early and don't forget as well on the 13th that's a really photogenic triplet there aldebaran pleiades and the moon and orion <laughs> i can't wait to see orion again and then towards the end of the month on the 28th, again, the moon is back with Jupiter, and on the 29th with Saturn. So a little repeat of the first two days of the month. Now, as for special events this month, we do have one of the best meteor showers of the year, the Perseid Meteor Shower. It peaks around somewhere between the 11th and the 13th. Best guess at the moment is uh, around midday, UTC time uh, on the 12th. So best viewing on the mornings of the 11th, the 12th and the 13th, where if you're in a dark sky location, when the radiant point is at its highest in the night sky, you can sometimes experience 100 meteors per hour. However, this year, the show will be a bit hindered by the last quarter moon. 
So the radiant point of the Perseids, which is of course in the constellation Perseus, in the evening you can find it in the northeast, and then as the night goes on, it gets higher and higher in the sky. Now, frustratingly, the moon rises just after 11 p.m. on the night of the 11th. As the radiant point is getting higher and higher in the night sky. The On the night of the 12th into the 13th, again, the moon rises at about local midnight. So it's going to wash out a lot of the smaller, fainter meteors, but a lot of the bright Perseids should shine through. And a lot of them do leave persistent, colourful trails as well, so... I wouldn't worry too much, it's not ideal. But the Perseids normally puts on a pretty good show. And then as you can see, towards the pre-dawn hours, the radium point keeps getting higher and higher and higher. And that's why the rate of Perseid meteors increases in the pre-dawn hours, because the radium point is higher in the sky, and they're all sort of streaking out from that point so when the radium point is low on the horizon you're still getting meteors around here but you're missing a lot of them because they're underneath the horizon but when the, the radium point is higher in the night sky um, they'll be bursting all over the sky in all directions so that's why the, the rate increases as the radium point gets higher in the night sky so it's very much a northern hemisphere meteor shower, but for those of you in the southern hemisphere, you can watch after midnight until the early hours of the morning, and you're probably best facing north or northeast to get a better chance of seeing some meteors. But for those of you in the northern hemisphere, you can watch from evening, from dusk till dawn, and there'll be meteors all night, although the rates do pick up in the early hours of the morning, but that kind of gets balanced out with the moonlight, so it's a really interesting one this year. But the Perseids is, is active for quite a few weeks, and even in the past week, I've seen quite a lot of uh, early Perseid meteors, and I've seen some images online as well uh, of a lot of early Perseids. So things are looking good. It might be a good year, um, and the Delta Aquarius is still very active, so do expect some very heightened meteor activity, uh, particularly for the first few weeks of August. But it'll be interesting to see how much the moon affects it this year. If the moon is in your frame when you're taking photographs, just be careful um, because depending on your lens, you might have a lens flare from the moon. So in that case, it'd be better to aim your camera a little bit away from the moon and perhaps use a lens hood as well to stop the moon catching the, the front element of your lens. And that's about it, guys. Keep an eye out for the ISS by downloading the app ISS Detector. And those of you, uh, like myself, in the mid to high northern latitudes, you'll certainly enjoy the longer, darker nights this month, and it will only get better and better from here. But onto the hashtag Wittens. For those of you that are new here, every month I set a subject, a target to photograph that month. People upload their images to Instagram and Twitter using the hashtag Wittens. And then I pick my favorite three. Uh, third place will win a copy of my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets. Second place wins a What's in the Night Sky t-shirt. And first place wins a Photo View Photography Guidebook of their choice. So uh, last month I asked you guys to take your photos of the noctilucent clouds and tag them with the hashtag Wittens. And in third place is this image from Rob Barsa, a lovely panorama, I'm not sure where this is, uh, of a strong noctilucent cloud display and even the rare red canopy. Sometimes on strong displays of NLCs you get this red canopy at the top so really gorgeous image and it's worth going to his page uh, and swiping through the panorama in in much better detail because it's really stunning in second place was this image of some noctilucent clouds behind whitby abbey and comet neowise there in the sky as well and i love that you can see the nlc's through the window frames of uh, the derelict abbey and the gorgeous colors of twilight and that harmony between the blue and yellow so 
Very well done to Tony, I really like that one. And in first place this month is this gorgeous image at Pendine Lighthouse by Matt Stansfield. And I was out this night, as were many other people. It was one of the most incredible noctilucent cloud displays I've ever seen. And to have the comet there as well, it was just an incredible night. But I love this composition, I love the colours. You've got the, the lighthouse there adding a nice interesting subject and sort of competing in brightness with those noctilucent clouds. They really were intense. And yeah, you've got the moonlight on the foreground, gorgeous colours of twilight. This image just really stood out for me this month. So well done to Matt. And I think this month, guys, it's finally time for everyone's favourite the Milky Way. We're into the latter half of Milky Way core season now. It's visible in the evening sky, so it's nice and accessible. And uh, it's a really nice August target. So let's go with the Milky Way core. And I'll keep an eye out for some Perseid meteor shots as well. So let's do Milky Way and Perseid meteors. And that's about all I have for you this month, guys. Huge thank you again for tuning in. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and you found this video useful because I make them every month. We've been going for over two years now, which is insane. So, again, thank you very much. And if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and peace, guys.